Thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to have uh, so many people on this uh, uh, meeting today. And uh, just one uh, note I'll make about the new members. Uh, Mesa Land in New Mexico and uh, Eastern New Mexico University in Rio Dosa just signed a MOU where uh, we're sharing our cybersecurity uh, program and they're sharing their uh, uh, wind energy program. And uh, so uh, we both have those degrees and we're gonna be working with them to get their CAE in the future. So uh, welcome for uh, Mesa Land. That's kind of real close to us in New Mexico. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about our uh, uh, presentations today. We have two presentations and uh, three speakers. Uh, the first presentation will be uh, with uh, Anastasia and Stacy Webster, as most of us know her as Stacy from the office of the chief uh, learning uh, officer. And uh, she's going to talk about what they're doing at the uh, at CISA, which is the Critical Infrastructure Security Agency. And then we'll have uh, uh, a co-founders, uh, Tina Zwolinski and Cynthia Jenkins uh, from Skill Gaps talking about the cyber watchdog and uh, what they've been doing uh, with, the, with uh, high school aged uh, youth. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, to Stacy and uh, I'll be muting. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah, take your, uh, unshare your uh, screen, Mike. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you guys all are doing well. First, before we get started, I want to wish you guys all a happy Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week, as well as a happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's been a huge month for us here at CISA, and I know our friends over at NIST nice as well. Um, I just want to dive into today's, uh, into today's presentation. If you guys want to know a little bit about my background, you can, I can share that a little bit later in the Q&A, um, but I do have a lot that I want to share with you guys today. Um, so first off, let's just talk a little bit about who CISA is and what we do. Um, we're actually one of the newest federal agencies that was stood up in 2018, and I think I can still safely say that we are one of the newest federal agencies. Our primary role is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk. And the reduce risk part is actually um, the newest update that happened when our most recent director, Director Easterly, onboarded. Um, so now we're not just trying to understand and mitigate, but also reduce the risk to cyber and physical infrastructure across the nation. We play a huge role in connecting a, a bunch of different stakeholders from government, industry, academia, to us, to other government resources, to each other, and produce analysis, um, 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 collect information, um, uh, collect information, compile it, send it back out, collect it again. And we also help produce tools that help people fortify cyber, physical, communications, and really um, uh, strengthen their own resilience and the resilience of the nation. We also wear a couple of different hats. Um, so we protect the federal civilian executive branch networks. We um, lead the effort to manage and reduce risk at the critical infrastructure or towards critical infrastructure. We provide timely assistance on a whole number of different um, 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 priorities, which I'll get into in just a second. We also lead asset response for federal cyber incidents. We also have a compliance role in there as well. We get a bunch of directives down from Congress um, and the president that we actually have to push out to all of the other federal agencies um, to make sure they're in compliance with whatever those directors or directives um, issue as far as compliance. And then we also see ourselves as the nation's cyber defense agency. So you're going to start hearing that from a lot. A lot. And I know our director in particularly um, really sees us as the nation's cyber defense agency. Part of our work at CISA, I should say most of our work at CISA is really reliance on the relationships we have with our partners again, across fe the federal government, across industry, and across academia. In fact, in this um, in the past couple of years, uh, we recently stood up the, uh, the Joint Cyber, Cyber Defense Collaborative, which is kind of a public-private partnership between us and industry and members of academia um, to really um, 
focus our efforts and help us understand the threats as they emerge. And that's really how we see ourselves as an organization, as a public-private, um, public-private collaborative partnership. Um, and so, you know, we've we've probably already started working with some of you, um, you guys, but um, if we haven't, that door's always open. That's pretty much what we're here for, is building those partnerships. And before I go on um, a little bit more into CISA, I do just want to say I am the academic programs lead arm for CISA. So I um, do some um, work with our federal partners, NSA and FBI, on the cyber um, the National Centers of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, as well as um, some work on the Cyber Corps Scholarship or Service Program. And um, we also work closely with our federal partners, NIST, um, a whole range of, of folks. So let's get into the actual most recent development here at CISA. This is actually just released. I think we put it out um, sometime within the past two months. And this is our strategic plan. This is really our first comprehensive strategy since our establishment in 2018. So it's a huge milestone for us. We've been super proud of it. We've been getting a lot of really good feedback about it. But if you guys haven't seen it yet, I recommend that you guys take a look at this because this is going to highlight our um, strategic um, efforts over the next three years. And it highlights, you know, um, it highlights our commitment to reduce risk, it highlights our commitment to come together as one unified agency. Um, because prior to 2018, we existed all over DHS HQ in various offices, and we came down in, uh, and we created our, our own agency, um, CISA. So we have four really ambitious goals that are outlined in the strategic plan. Three of these goals focus on how the agency is going to work um, to reduce risk and build resilience, while the fourth, fourth goal is internally facing, um, focusing on our one CISA strategy. So I won't get into this document, um, but I will um, post the link to it later in, in the chat so you guys can take a look at it. Now let's talk about our work very quickly. Um, we have, you know, it's so funny, I just did a, another presentation yesterday at one of our CAEs, and we have jobs that cover a wide range of um, wide range of work here that we do at CISA. Um, we work in cloud, we work in 5G, we, you know, we're developing stuff in AI machine learning, pretty much all of the emerging technologies. But let's get a little bit more into our direct work. So the work that I'm going to talk about now actually translates really well into the way that CISA is organized. And we're organized among different divisions and mission enabling offices. And some of this work overlaps among the different divisions that I'm going to show you guys here in a little bit. So partnership development is huge for CISA. Um, one of the things that you'll hear me say often is information is our currency. Um, this is because we're collecting information um, from our government partner, from state, local, tribal, territorial, governments from industry, even academia, and we're, um, you know, synthesizing that, analyzing it, and then pushing it back out to everybody almost in real time. Um, so we're back, uh, partnerships are really the backbone of CISA, um, because literally none of the work that we would be able to do would be possible without those partnerships. So partnership development is huge. Um, we actually have our stakeholder engagement division that does a majority of this work, but honestly, it happens across our divisions. We're also very heavy into information and data sharing. Um, that's pretty much um, one of the reasons why we were set up. We have certain authorities that allow us to take information from the intelligence agencies and other agencies within government, synthesize it, um, take out any classified information, um, scrub that information and then push it out to the public, like I said, almost near real time. Um, you know, we have in information and data sharing, we have operational planning, we do training and exercise risk and vulnerability assessments. Um, we also have our watch floor operation. We actually were fortunate enough this week to host some, um, some students in our watch floor. And we have two watch floors, one lo located in the NCR region and the other one located in our Pensacola office. We also have capacity building. Um, we provide technical assistance tools, exercise training programs, and awareness efforts that are really focused on heightening the understanding of common risks and possible mitigation strategies. And this includes both cyber and physical. We also have incident management response. So think our hunt and incident response team also calls our hurt team that are ready to be deployed anywhere. And we see ourselves as serving as a lead for coordinating activities within the federal, state, local, tribal, territorial governments, as well as the private sector. 
Um, again, we're producing that information in near real time and responding to risks and near and and vulnerabilities in near real time. And actually, probably the one of the coolest things that I saw here at CISA was our response to solar winds, log 4 j even the most recent hurricane that just happened um, down on the southern eastern coast. Um, got a lot of really great folks out there right now um, in Florida, Puerto Rico, and Texas that are actually helping with the hurricane response. Um, we also have risk assessment and analysis. This um, in this effort, we develop and enhance capabilities to support crisis action by identifying and prioritizing infrastructure through the use of analysis and modeling capabilities. So this would go, or an example of this would be, for example, hurricane modeling. Um, you know, what, what would the risk of this hurricane hitting the US due to, let's say, emergency communications or um, um, lighting or um, you know, even pipes? We take a look at everything. And then we produce those reports. And it, each year, CISA conducts almost more than 100,000 hometown security initiatives that directly take a look at the risk that is imposed to these businesses. We also have network defense. Um, and here we develop new process tools, technologies to assess cyber and physical threats and vulnerabilities to people and property. We're sharing this information with our partners, um, especially our, our critical infrastructure partners. And we serve as cyber and physical security experts as well. And I just wanna highlight the physical security aspect of it because a lot, not, not a lot of people, I mean, I know we have um, cyber security and infrastructure security in our name, but we all are, are also really heavily into physical, uh, physical security. Um, think big events, like for example, the Super Bowl's Coming up, Rihanna's gonna Rihanna's gonna be at the Super Bowl. Um, you know, how does that event stay secure throughout the whole event? Uh, there's a multiple of layers that are involved in that, um, and CISA is actually involved in that, so it's pretty cool. We also have emergency communications. Um, emergency communications is actually kind of an interesting one because not a lot of people, you know, it's not in our names, so and not a lot of people associate emergency communications with CISA. Um, but emergency communications is really the backbone we find of, you know, getting the getting the nation mm -hmm. to function um, and, and respond to these disaster um, um, scenarios. And it's really a big part of our instant response efforts as well. So one of the things that's going on right now um, down in Texas is, you know, restoring the services that um, came down, making sure that, you know, ambulances, fire, law enforcement, they're all able to access um, you know, emergency communications and speak to one another. And this was actually something that we inherited from DHS um, as part of DHS's inherited um, uh, mission and responsibilities that came out of the 9-11 Commission report. There was a lack of ability among fire, law enforcement, um, um, fire law, law enforcement and um, paramedics to kind of be able to communicate with one another. So that's a huge part of our mission as well. And actually emergency communications, just so you guys know, is one of our largest and one of our largest divisions and what I consider kind of our top three. Um, so this is just our structure really quickly so you guys can get an idea of how we're organized. Um, this is available on our website as well. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the most recent one with all of the names that are included on it, but we have our uh, mission enabling off offices up here at the top, mm -hmm. and I also sit up here in the mission enabling offices, and then we have each one of our divisions. Um, the divisions, the way that their name pretty much speaks for what they do, um, cybersecurity division, we have our cyber defense operations, which detect and, and prevent um, activity across the nation. We have our federal network governance and capacity building, our critical infrastructure, as, um, state, local, tribal, territorial governance and capacity building also within there. We also have our um, cybersecurity training and education team within there. Um, and in, in the infrastructure security division, this is where you're gonna have our combat, um, combating domestic violence and extremism team, our national infrastructure protection plan. We also have our CFATS folks, which is our chemical security folks. Uh, in emergency communication division, we have um, our nationwide emergency communication plans. Um, we um, have a bunch of different grant programs that support these communications and interoperability nationally. Um, they're building capacity. They're also taking a look at well as well right now as 
how these new and emerging technologies are going to impact emergency communications going forward. Um, because one of the things that we've also been seeing is a bunch of folks texting and sending videos and, you know, how do we actually secure that to make sure it's going to the right folks. We also have safe common here as well. Um, our National Risk Management Center, um, these are the folks that are actually going through and performing those risk assessments to our nation's critical infrastructure. Our stakeholder engagement folks are the ones that are out um, trying to develop those partnerships so that we can get that information and then push it back out. And then our integrated operation folks, these folks are actually everywhere. They're embedded all across the nation in each one of what we call the CISA regions. And I think I have a slide of that coming up. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to show you guys um, kind of where CISA has involvement. We're involved in each one of these six, six, 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Some of them are in the purview of CISA alone, whereas other ones we actually have to work with these other agencies like DOD, like DOE, in order to um, you know, over, oversee or participate and get information from those specific sectors, especially Department of Energy, right? They're the ones that control the energy grid. So if there is an energy problem and we need to restore services, we're going to be the first people that we're calling. And honestly, that's kind of a huge portion of what CISA does. We are the right people that know who to call to get um, different pieces of what we need done. Um, then this last slide that I have here is just um, an overview of the different regions. Um, we actually do have cybersecurity and physical security advisors in each one of these regions. And um, I'm, you know, we've actually ha have a really robust um, um, integrated operations division. And I would say, you know, we're working on getting folks literally, you know, I think we have 100 right now, but we're working on getting, you know, 200 across the United States. So it's likely pretty soon we're going to have a person in every state here, which is amazing, um, because our, our goal is really to have these folks sitting in, you know, those, those state offices, those um, DIO offices at the state level and engaging with the industry within those states. So real quickly, I know I'm running out of time here, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, CISA careers. Um, we do have hiring initiatives that are focused across all levels, but right now, especially entry level. Um, one of the things that you'll hear me say ad nauseum, this is, is very top heavy. Um, we're a small and mighty team, but we're also a top heavy team. So we're really seeking to grow that entry level talent you know, and have them develop throughout their time here at CISA. So we've got a lot of different activities that are focused on you know bringing in talent from underserved underrepresented places all across the united states um we're definitely interested in diversity as a huge focus of our hiring efforts um and we're also interested as well as getting the talent from a bunch of different sources community colleges that's going to be a huge push that you'll see from i um, mean actually i'm going to be at the ate center conference next week if any of you guys are going to be there so we can we can chat um, as well as, you know, trade schools. Um, and we're all even looking at non-traditional pathways um, as well into CISA. So we have our two hiring pathways right now, um, which is really exciting. We have our standard GS system, which you're going to have to have certain qualifications in order to qualify for that GS level. So for example, if you wanted to start off as a GS9, you would have to have a bachelor's and a master's at least. And that's not even counting you know, additional experience. Um, if you wanted to do something a little different, you could try our CTMS um, which we also call our Cyber Talent Management System, also known as DHS Cybersecurity Service. So you could hear it in any one of the two. Um, but this one actually allows you to have any, you know, it doesn't really judge you based off of your education or, you know, certifications that you have. It's really an, an evaluation of skill and whether or not you can perform the tasks that are needed to perform um, that specific workforce role. So um, it's really you competing against you, um, and there is also um, a paid benefit to it in the sense that it pays you closer to what you would make in industry um, versus right now the GS is, is very um, rigidly aligned to the OPM um, GS schedule. Um, so these are two of our, you know, our pathways. We're really super proud about both of them. Um, we're really proud about getting the CTMS. It's taken us years to bring this on board and we're really excited to have folks start applying to it and again you can apply at any level um you know we've even seen some people like straight out of high school applying to this which is pretty cool 
Um, and this actually goes back to just DHS recognizing the talents anywhere, and we need to we need to get all of the talent that we can here in the federal government. I also want to highlight our NICS page as well, our National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies. If you guys haven't checked it out, we do post a lot of um, a lot of information as it pertains to what CISA specifically is doing in cyber workforce development. Um, we have some information we have uh, on see our participation in CAE SFS, as well as some tools that students can use to actually chart their pathway and their career in cyber. So with that, I think my time is coming to an end here. So I will go on mute and stop sharing my screen here. Okay, thanks, uh, Stacy, And uh, we'll take questions on, on her presentation after uh, the skill gap uh, speakers. And so I'll turn it over to Tina and Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And really, Mike, Corrine, your team there at Insight has been so helpful to our company. And so uh, great appreciation. Uh, and um, Stacy, your company has been a big part of some content we're about to share. Yeah. And had no idea how uh, large and expansive the organization is. So that was really helpful to hear. Um, and then at the end, just talking about the workforce, which we're gonna follow right along the conversation on uh, with Skills Gap. And so you have uh, myself, uh, co-founder, CEO of Skills Gap, and Cynthia Jenkins, who is um, on this too, that we're gonna switch off so you don't have to hear one voice the whole time. But our company, Skills Gap, is a workforce pipeline development initiative. And we use mobile gaming uh, as a tool to uh, attract the workforce. And cyber is one of our game models. And so we're going to jump in and have a little fun. Um, I did want to give a shout out. I saw you had a new member, University of South Carolina, Aiken. So if you're on the call, um, hello, I'm in South Carolina. Our headquarters are in South Carolina and Cynthia. Our other office uh, with development and marketing is in California. So anybody there, um, just a little hello to some home state people. Anybody in Florida, I'll be in Florida at the chamber meeting and I saw several of you on the um, speaking agenda. So I look forward to hearing more of this conversation there in person. But let me share my screen and I'll start off with just sharing a little bit about what we're doing. And just even uh, a lot of the community colleges, higher ed, high school industry that might be on the call, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on each of those. So let me a little something for everybody in today's cyber talk. So for us, we like to play up that the best defense is an early offense. So looking back to middle school, high school, and how they feed into uh, the community colleges and ultimately into the workforce like CISA and um, just within the different states. And so how can we build that pipeline to be sustainable? So just quick on the two of us, our background, uh, we launched our company in 2020, which, um, a year that all of us will never forget, but it's a year that really kind of pushed us out earlier than we had planned on for the need to engage with youth as they were uh, locked down at home. But our background, 25 years of a branding and marketing firm focused on economic development, workforce, and youth and their success, profit and um, for-profit and nonprofit. So in each of these areas from education, from K-12, all the way up to continuing ed, uh, economic development and uh, gaming from all the games that kids play, our teams have been a part of development and a lot of the fun games. I don't know if we have any gamers on the call today. I and Cynthia, we're not gamers. <laughs> we, know, we know that's where our audience is. So just jumping into a challenge that I know everybody on this call is aware of, and uh, we're all fighting the same fight of getting these jobs filled, 700,000 plus jobs. Uh, and really, when we look at the K-12, we're looking at lack of awareness. They don't know what these jobs are. They might hear cyber and they might just think it's you know hacking, but how can we let them know of the multi jobs that are out there, hundreds of jobs that they might have a strength in one area. Another challenge is uh, the computer science programs um, are either being dropped or scaled back due to lack of being able to um, secure teachers um, because the workforce is trying to keep that, those people there. So there's that challenge. For the colleges on the call, you know that just sometimes marketing the programs to get that right outreach, the message to the right people so that these K-12 people know those programs exist can be a challenge. 
and filling those courses. And, th and that's what we like to do is fill seats. Um, and then the lack of diversity and access in these careers. So underserved communities being able to be made aware, but also how do they get into them? So for us focusing on that access of getting into the community college or into those jobs in the industry, four-year programs, how do we provide, uh, remove barriers and create access and opportunity? And on the last one, that fear of failure. So a lot of students might think that you need a PhD, extensive work to be a heavy coder in this field, but um, being able to make them aware of the successes that they can have starting out early and then uh, you know having the industry help build them up in their careers. So the solutions that we like to talk about um, is how can we solve some of these challenges, support each other, fill the jobs. So for K-12, it comes down to let's get awareness, really moving in those schools and provide that access to those careers right around the players and also to the pathways. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit, what you can do with geolocation and helping colleges understand that um, within our model that we're gonna show that you can promote your programs to the players. So if they're playing a cyber game, well, there's a an audience that's already interested in what you're doing. And so being able to recruit them um, into your programs, into your jobs uh, could lead to less turnover and, and really filling programs. And the opportunity with um, mobile phones, just some quick stats, which might be interesting since we're all numbers people, data people, so Gen Z is middle school, high school, or really up to age 24 entering these jobs. 98% of them have access to a mobile phone, no matter their economic level, wherever they are. So, and on top of that, 90% of them play mobile games. And it's those quick puzzle games that are fun while they're, you know, five, seven minutes while they're in between things. But the interesting stat, seven hours a day, they are on their phones on top of school. So there's this real opportunity to go to your workforce, uh, incoming workforce, where they are and really creating opportunity there. And so that's underserved communities, um, playing these games, engaging with them and um, females into these STEM jobs you know, for gaming and that Gen Z, it is a even split of uh, female to males that are engaging with gaming. Um, it's, it's happening in education and probably a lot of you in your workforce. I know in cyber, there are several opportunities out there already where gaming hits on some coding and some opportunities there. But for the students, you think about a, a non-threatening environment. If you could be in a game it's uh, a single player. There's other little characters in it, but you can fail, try things, uh, improve your scores in a non-threatening environment. So it really gives the opportunity to try on jobs and be able to experience what's available out there. And if you like it, to be able to pursue that. So imagine gamified career awareness where they can do role-playing, that they can actually connect with an educational pathway or all of the community colleges for a year could recruit these players. Think about the scalability for filling these 700,000 jobs by doing this in a two-way real-time engagement. So as things change in cyber, immediately the kids get to learn about what's out there. So Cynthia is going to jump in here and um... I, I am going to jump. And before you press play, <laughs> the good news is you don't have to imagine any longer <laughs> the gamification. And I, I did want to add that when Tina and I started this, um, the, the skills gap within cyber was actually 500,000. And then with just within the two years, it's now jumped up to, to 700,000. And as we look at skills gap, our name problem solution all in one, in one it's because butts and seats was taken. So um, just to set this up, this is um, a, a trailer and it's fast. So forgive us, um, but it'll kick off the weekend. It's called Cyber Watchdog. And essentially, as Tina said, it's geared toward middle and high schoolers. Um, we did have a huge launch in Southern California for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so it basically puts the player in a job construct. So they work for a third party cybersecurity company that's called Cerberus. And there's a, a Greek mythology thread there that I won't bore you with. 
um, where the player has to handle the various organizations' computer needs. Um, they have to guard cyberspace. They have to complete missions, face down a global band of hackers, which is becoming um, less fictional these days. And, and I'm, I'm inspired, Stacey, for a, a, a Super Bowl Rihanna um, mini challenge at some point, but I'm going to, it is about a minute and we'll, we'll kind of show you the highlights and then afterwards we'll kind of unpack um, how this, how this solves the workforce issues. If there's any challenges with the play, Stephen is going to have this posted after so you could go in and watch it um, any other time as well. Well, we had some subtle click to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was definitely a little wonky on my end, but um but we, I, I can sort of unpack a little bit, and as Tina said, we'll we'll make this, we'll share this after 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 the um the call. But essentially, um, what the, in terms of the geospecificity? So in in the game, there's basically base gameplay where the player has a bunch of tasks. They have to decrypt data, encrypt data, go to the server, do X Y Z, and then you could kind of see for those of you who are gamers. Um, mini games would then be deployed that are specific, specifically aligned to proficiencies on binary code, um, email, phishing, those kinds of things that are aligned with some of the, the um, nice curriculum. But what's interesting is, so after you've completed a challenge, and this went kind of quickly, but you are given a, a fact about what you've just done. So, you know, see what you just did there, you could be a data loss prevention engineer. And guess what? there are um, 500 jobs available right here in, in that sector. And here's a technical college to go to, to pursue that. And so what's interesting, you can see here um, on the screen is as, so this is available on the app store, free to play always. And you, you basically pull down to select your region. And then what happens is the information specific to your region is then populated into that game. So you could see what was, if you were able to see, um, that's most of the uh, San Bernardino Inland Empire here in Southern California was, was the version that we showed you. So what happens is, is this game, um, again, there were three environments and um, within each and with its, within each challenge, you're given geospecific career and pathway, not just awareness, but also access. There's also um, some sort of lexicon and other careers that you can kind of, we call it the codex. It's sort of like a glossary of terms, um, uh, just an, an exhaustive list of all the different um, um, specialty areas and work roles within cybersecurity. So what happens is, is, is as Tina was sharing, there's this a two-way opportunity here, even though it's a single player um, uh, interface environment, but we can you know, feed them the CTE pathways, local companies, um, post-secondary, there are badges that can be industry um, recognized. Um, those are scalable, they can be stackable, but they're basically aligned with the um, NICE uh, framework. And then, of course, uh, the data can then, player data based on their proficiencies, based on all COPA, you know, uh, privacy laws, is you can then recruit to the players um, opportunities for boot camps, uh, scholarships, and, and those um, open houses, those kinds of things. So as, as Tina said, uh, in terms of why this platform is so powerful is, 
again, 95% of this next workforce generation has access to a smartphone, 90% classify themselves as gamers, and of course, the screen time, while none of us are probably very happy that they're spending nine hours on the screen, we, can, we can't change that, but we can change what they're doing on them. So that's sort of um, the nutshell of the game. In terms of the DEI initiatives, which you know we always say this, we don't have a people problem, we have, we have an awareness problem. And it's because there's a huge population that's, that's underrepresented. And um, so in our, and this is an avatar customization and um, within there you can choose different uh, skin tones, different hair, different accessories, and each one is aligned with specific um, jobs and roles in cybersecurity. So even if you don't pick um, a CPO, you can say, woo, they make over 200 grand. <laughs> Maybe I'll rethink that. So that's um, the avatar selection is something really powerful in terms of getting seeing yourself in cyber. Um, I did mention the, the mini games that are um, basically proficiency aligned there in this game, there are five there's the PC builder where you have to classify key parts of a computer binary code analyze foundational patterns of a computer numbering system password hash assessing the integrity of passwords phishing scams, this is a fun one evaluate um, and validate the safety of external communications and then of course password strength. Um, so these are things that um, are directly pulled from a lot of the sort of essentials or fundamentals of cybersecurity 101 in a lot of your programs. And then within each in, in the game, we have um, six badges that uh, are some are easier than others, but they are directly aligned to speed accuracy of um, not just content, but, um, you know, per, basically completing the, the challenges in the mini games accurately. And if you don't, you're, you're kind of refed it again until you can. Um, and then, of course, each of ours um, includes soft skills as well. This is that's that's a universal issue, soft skills, but um, especially in a in a um, when it comes to cybersecurity and teamwork and leadership and collaboration, sometimes those feel counterintuitive. And so we really reinforce those three. And then in terms of player outcomes, and then we're almost done and we're at, almost out of time. Um, these you'll you'll recognize a lot in terms of some of your syllabi, but um, uh, after you complete this game, you, a player would recognize 100 cyber terms, job descriptions and salaries, recall general information with specific security topics and concepts, apply better passwords, understand basic cryptographic principles, basic, um, understand how computer works and network basics, um, various security technologies, understand a variety of frequent attacks. Um, there are, we have a, a bank in this particular one, um, and understanding browser security and privacy issues. And then of course the big ha ha is localized courses and pathways to further pursue your cybersecurity education and ultimately employment. Um, we, so yes, we actually, it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month and we just had a huge launch, which is partially why I'm sort of um, hoarse, is uh, we, how the, how the kids are, are, are responding. I think we have just in one day, we had over, I think a thousand downloads and these, the kids are loving them. So the, you can see here, I would play this game instead of watching TikTok that's a win. And then I've been on the fence about taking computer science and now it's all I want to take. And a lot of that is not just the awareness of pathways, et cetera, but as we, we all are in, well, I'm not, I'm not, but now I'm, I am now um, cybersecurity pseudo expert, but it is a really abstract term and um, industry. And so to put it in the context of sort of a fun job construct um, is really, is a real eye opener to these kids to where they're actually now able to proactively say, I want to take this CTE class or camp or et cetera, because now they have the lexicon and the context. Let me play this one uh, student's comment from this week. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool that they're doing it here in San Bernardino County because Cassie San Bernardino has like one of the best programs for cybersecurity and that kind of thing, especially now that everything is online. And um, there's just like cyber attacks all, all over the place. It's neat to see them identifying what's happening in the real world, yeah. the school around them. Oops, here we go. So just a, just a wrap up of our game. So we do go in with partners. It's free to play for students at all times so that all barriers are removed. Uh, so that access is available into these careers and learning about the pathways around them and then uh, into the jobs. Uh, so we work with partners on a, subscrip a subscription model. 
um, which can either include some marketing support, partner support, or just kind of a toolkit uh, deployment and even pilots available in areas to give it a test of, of how it works, what it looks like. Um, and even thinking about as you're doing grants um, for programs that you have, it's something that we could partner on to um, help add a tool or resource in that has data that even in games, we can do surveys and things to show that they're learning throughout to provide that evidence proof um, to a resource tool that's being used. And so the outcome is that one day we are on these calls and we're talking about industry and, and the 700,000 has come way down to um, where these jobs and, and students are going into them. So reaching, you know, if you think about a job fair of 100 to 1,000, now you can reach 10,000 to 100,000 through an initiative um, and touching those underserved, trying on the careers, engaging with contests and rewards to keep them playing and interested, um, alignment with learning outcomes in different states that, you know, members are in here on this call, and just that ability to recruit to no bias. When you recruit a player, you do not know um, gender, race, anything. And so it's really a beautiful recruitment tool. So that's just a quick, fast pace. We will, um, um, the Micah and Steven are gonna have this available. So you could watch that video. If there were some bandwidth challenges there through the play, but we appreciate you today. And just thinking differently about ways to recruit and engage with students on top of what you're doing already to fill these jobs. Okay, hey, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Tina and Cynthia. Uh, if you have any questions, you could either put them in the chat or just uh, uh, come off mute and ask a question. I did see one about the, um, and I, I'm- I Hi, I, good afternoon. Go ahead, Ayad. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Ayad Bersoum from St. Mary's University. I was asking because this is very nice and interesting games and we always hold and um, schedule like summer camps for middle and high school students. So I am asking, is there a possibility for this game to be played on PCs or laptops or only mobile phones? That, that was your question. So they, they can be played on Chromebooks and using the, um, what do you call it, the East, what, you can, they can be deployed on, um, on laptops. Not, not optimal, but, but it's, it's a good play. The only, the only thing with that that I'll say is in terms of the geospecificity is typically based on where your, your phone is. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be one consideration as, as you look at, um, you know, localized pathways to you. Mm, okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, San Bernardino, Riverside, they're using it on Chromebooks too. So that's, it, the play is there. You just lose a little bit of that geolocation yeah. feed, but it still works hard for filling jobs. Go ahead, Casas. Um, a, a quick question, Anastasia. Um, the, the, the big bad word bachelor's uh, degree required, mm -hmm. is that always mm -hmm. a requirement at DHS or do you accept folks with less than a bachelor's degree for a cyber career? So it really depends upon which, you know, which system they are going to use. If they're going to use GS, that's a little bit more rigid, right? Because that's set by OPM. But under the new CTMS, we have a lot more flexibility in what we can do as far as hiring folks. So if you got a person that's super talented and is like, why do I need to go to college? Um, you know, why do I, why do I need to get all these certs? I would put them through, I would put them through CTMS and it allows greater flexibility as far as career opportunities and different projects that they're going to get to work on. So that would, that would be where I would push them to. But mind you, if you want kind of more the traditional government route, then I would, I would gear them more to see, uh, for, to the GS, um, OPM schedule. Thank you. Shankar, you have a question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tina. You mentioned that uh, students in high school, they don't know the, the broad range of jobs in the cyber domain. And because people think cyber is only pen testing, only hacking, that there are jobs for software engineers, crypto analysts, cyber law policy ethics, legal analysts, risk assessment, a lot of wide varieties of jobs. Uh, so that's why during our high school summer camp, we try to bring 
the professionals from industry and agencies to talk to the students about the job in cyber domain, try to do that. But the challenge you're facing is the parents. How do you reach the parents? Because uh, th this cyberspace is, is very new because you know that if you want to be a doctor, you have to go to medical school. But for cyber, that is not clearly defined, defined yet. So how do you reach out to the parents so they know about the jobs in cyber, their kids, what they can do with the degree and what they can do out of the career in the federal government or industry? How do we reach out to the parents and in, inform, educate them? Yes, that's a very good question. It is important so the parents can have the conversation of other job opportunities to encourage their kids in. Uh, and a lot of that we really push through the kids to have the conversation back with the parents because once they're excited about it, they can ask. So when we deploy, we work really closely with the school systems in the states or regions that we go into. Uh, and so getting their buy-in and they communicate heavily with the game is used in school, out of school, and there's communication with the parents and all to get them excited. And it's used at STEM events and all sorts of things. So getting that exciting uh, momentum, but really having those kids so they're navigating these jobs that you just shared, all of them. And so now they start to learn, they know how to advocate this generation for themselves. And so really arming them with the tool and the message to go back and say, I'm playing this game, it's so much fun. Um, the Citadel has a program that I would love to be a part of. How do I get into it? And just now the career counselors at the school and the teachers and the parents actually have some language and direction to start guiding their student uh, child because of that um, communication that's happening. And so uh, really we look to the students to start that energy and that conversation and then having the wisdom of the career teachers, parents to start that guiding now. Or you can recruit them right from the game. <laughs> there was another conversation, um, Edmund mentioned, um, how do the colleges get their career, their cyber programs to show up in the cyber game? We do deploy, just because there are costs with deployment, we look for partners, typically it could be a state or a large region or an industry that wants to, you know, a company that wants to take over an area. Um, and then they help just to cover the cost of that game deployment. Um, and then we work in that area to make sure that all the pathways are included. But community colleges can add more in. They can put a video in, a link off to a course landing page to enroll or a summer camp. Um, so that we're capturing these kids. If they're interested, they can jump over and then apply, find out more, um, and be able to track that data too to show, wow, okay, that many players were interested in, in finding out more. Hey, I think uh, if you have any more questions, you can always email uh, Ike or myself and we'll get them to, uh, to, to uh, Stacy or to, uh, Tina and uh, Cynthia. So I'll turn this back over to Mike. You have some final uh, words and I'm gonna thank uh, our speakers uh, for great information. And uh, I'm sure they're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of follow-up. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, so thank you, <clears throat> Tina, Cynthia and Stacy for a great presentation today. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope you um, got something out of this Insight uh, monthly member meeting. Um, I'm certain that you did, and we'd love to get your feedback on the meeting. So every year we have to sit down and plot out what we're going to do for next year. So please um, answer the survey. I dropped the link into the quiz, um, into the chat. Um, so we would really appreciate um, you filling that out and giving us your feedback. Um, very good presentations today. I, again, thank you. Um, everybody for being here. Thanks and for having us.